welcome. Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tallinn University and the School of Humanities for inviting me to deliver this talk. Uh, what you can see the title here on the first slide, the Transmodern Paradigm and Contemporary Feminism to, to Crossroads. This is the question mark. Um, special thanks are due to the leader of the Gender Studies Group, Dr. Kadri Avik, and my colleague and friend, Dr. Julia Kuznetsky, for her continuous support and our fruitful collaboration, as she has just explained. I'd like to contextualize my presentation within the research we are carrying out in the group I belong to at the University of Zaragoza, as you can see there, on contemporary narratives in English, and our current project on literature in the transmodern era, celebration, limits, and transgression, led by Professor Dolores Herrero. You can also see that we are organizing a conference for next year, Transmodern Literatures of the Limit. So we hope we can finally have a face-to-face -face event. So you are invited to participate. Uh, starting from some of the findings of our previous projects and drawing on the turn to ethics, trauma studies, affect theory, our team is now trying to elaborate on this criticism by enlightening the ways in which a renewed sociocultural and collective politics can be endorsed on the basis of the so-called crossroads, a term I use also for, for my title, of transmodernity. So today I will try to provide an insight first into what the transmodern paradigm implies to focus on the effects that transmodernity may have on the current feminist panorama, as well as on how diverse feminist movements have shaped transmodernity. I'd like to demonstrate that the transmodern paradigm has itself an original feminist essence since transmodernity incorporates many values defended by contemporary feminism, many intersectional and transnational approaches. I argue that the transmodern project tries to move forward the feminist mission by including in its caring principles, both men and women, as well as all living beings on earth. And by revalorizing those caring values that have been assigned to women. Some examples of cultural representations will be offered to explain how the transmodern feminist ethos is giving way to a more relational perception of the world. And finally, I think we could all discuss the question of whether or not the transmodern paradigm can offer some impulse uh, that I think that global feminism meets in the face of today's patriarchal backlash. Current scholars working on the transmodern paradigm have defined transmodernity, quoting Atil Gebic, as an umbrella term that connotes the emerging sociocultural, economic, political, and philosophical shift we are experiencing in the era of globalization. This emerged at the end of the 80s as the synthesis of modernity and postmodernity. Its relationship with these previous historical periods should be borne in mind since transmodernity tries to attend to the modern project without completely rejecting the postmodern critique that dismantled its limitations. Such critics as Dussel, G.C., Atuljevic, transcend transmodernity as a near period and emphasize the liberating potential of a different way of being in the world. For Atuljevic, quoting her again, the transmodern is characterized by a planetary vision in which humans are beginning to realize that we are all connected into one system. Transmodernity is also essentially post patriarchal in a sense that women's visions and intuitions are to be recognized as indispensable in order to invent together innovative urgent solutions. In addition to this, she explains that we are on the edge of a new relational consciousness that can lead to the willingness to accept contradicting realities and multicultural perspectives. What this scholar highlights is that while many different labels are describing this global shift in consciousness, economic, politics, human relations. You can see some of these labels on the screen. All of them signpost similar aspirations for inclusivity, variety, human rights, and the rights of nature. In the transmodern era, humans, we seem to be more aware of the way mutual interdependency grows and how the hierarchies between different cultures dismantle. For Dussel, the driving force of transmodernity is this intercultural dialogue which provides the transmodern with quoting a theoretic potentiality to articulate a critical cosmopolitanism beyond nationalism and colonialism. And GC defends that the blurring of cultural hierarchies are essential steps to understand our new world order. Therefore, in an era where the new master narrative seems to be globalization, a different framework for the world is necessary. 
one that reveals the interconnectedness of identity, history, memory, and culture, while avoiding totalizing practices, and one that connects local descriptions of particular situations with their cross-cultural implications. These new world views, of course, influence the way fiction is produced and conceived. For example, there appears to be a refreshed commitment with history. Contemporary writers still demonstrate an impulse to blur the lines between fiction and reality. However, when historical elements are introduced, the main aim is to look for alternative versions of history, underlining the objectivity of the sources included, without highlighting any viscous artificiality, as happens in postmodernism. Moreover, emotions play a key role in our recent literature due to the author's interest in portraying humans as related to each other. Multidirectional views of human relationships in which our stories transcend periods of time, connecting us to similar experiences of migration and conflict are promoted. This way, transmodern fiction seems to respond to the intertwined connection between the global and the local, as well as the influence of global economic, sociocultural, and political factors in the individual but an individual always in relation to others. Accordingly, Dussel fosters the transmodern need for alternative versions of history that emerge from the experience of dominated groups of people. And quoting him, transmodern culture would have a rich pluriversity and would be the fruit of an authentic intercultural dialogue that would need to be clearly in mind existing asymmetry, end quote. We believe in our team that literature and literary analysis can be powerful vehicles not only to denounce the manipulation of facts or, or equality, but also to conform an epistemological category, which enables us to move towards new and future cultural representations emerging out of this discourse of globalization. Drawing on Rosa Maria Rodriguez Marta's distinction between narratives of celebration, you may see the description there, those which reiterate an accepted topic and complete the nuances of the dominant discourse and making it hegemonic, and narratives of the limit, those which struggle to think what has not been conceptualized yet, to say what still has no name, they tear away their old armor and in order to explore their skin landscapes still unknown. We attempt to adhere to the latter as a new shift in literary works written in English, which reflects of policies of relationality, activism, and change. Magda's second category would find an equivalent in the liminal writings that pervade our literary panorama. Liminality frames many transmodern writings in their generic hybridity, formal experimentation, the topics, episodes represented, or the time and space relationships depicted. Now, I would like to suggest, and this is like my main research question that I am elaborating for an article I am writing. So, all your feedback and suggestions at the end would be really welcome. Uh, I would like to suggest that feminism and transmodernity can be conceived as two interrelated categories, since the transmodern paradigm has an original, an original feminist basis, in that transmodernity incorporates many values endorsed by different feminist trends in the last few decades. I will draw some of the areas of feminism that are connected to transmodern values, like the ethics of care, relational autonomy, vulnerability studies, since they promote a model of human interdependence that could transform gender relations and improve the position of women globally. The notion that the self is in constant relationship with the other has been promoted by many thinkers, developing the vulnerability paradigm. In the Empire of Trauma, Fashin and Rechtman describe how the attitudes towards trauma victims have evolved from mistrust to sympathy. Critics working in the field have highlighted one's tendency to be affected by the other's wounds and vulnerability. Drawing on the realization that the post 9 11 world is replete with, according to Butler, heightened vulnerability, Butler and Athanasio argue that being open to our physical and psychological wounds prepares the ground for reflecting on those of others. Thus, being acquainted with our own vulnerability can help us feel closer to the other's wounds, as well as it confirms that we are all interdependent subjects. Yet, I would like to call attention to the fact that these theories are not completely new, but they have been put forward by different strands of feminisms before. The ethics of care, or so-called the ethics of love, relational ethics, has its origins in the second wave feminism in the US and Europe and the end of the 60s, as a movement advocating the experience of women, quote, in health, as important, relevant, and philosophically interesting as those of men. 
the ethics of care considers the experience of women in caring activities to be central and emphasizes the values inherent in caring practices as necessary for our society. It shares with feminist thought the reconceptualization of traditional notions about the public and the private, and the challenge to the traditional subject of morality, a male subject. An important figure here is Carol Gilligan, who already in the 80s articulated the theory of a different female voice, fostering a feminist vision based on solidarity and interconnection. Considering that all human relationships require the emotional endurance ascribed to women, Gilligan denounced that women have often lacked a, vo a voice of their own to represent their experiences. Nevertheless, some feminist thinkers have been suspicious of some of these ideas. Liberal feminists are afraid that it could reinforce the domestic values that have relegated women to the private sphere, or philosophers like Martha Nussbaum think it could go to the detriment of the citizen's freedom, mainly women's. In order to address this problem, feminist scholars developed models of autonomy that could imply the integration of an ethics of care with an autonomous female self, without losing sight of our interdependence on others since we are born. Mackenzie and Stolger, for instance, have coined the notion of relational autonomy as the conviction that all individuals are socially embedded, not only women, and that their identities are formed quote, in them within the context of social relationships and shaped by a complex of intersecting social determinants." End quote. They see autonomy as a set of capacities that can be trained in order to develop some values of self-respect. These ideas also lead us to see intersectional and transnational approaches to feminism as concurrent with the transmodern feminist ethos because of their emphasis on providing a feminist alternative to colonial, liberal, and Western models of thought. Intersectional feminism holds the view that the repression suffered by women must be analyzed by considering the multifarious mechanisms that shape female identity, not only gender, but also class, sexuality, race. More precisely, this term was coined by legal feminist theorist Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. She used the metaphor of the intersection to evoke how different identity categories come together when oppressing women demonstrated that those identity politics that were not able to see sexism and racism as intertwined could never include women of color in the feminist struggle. However, the term can be traced back to the 19th century when the tensions between the feminist and anti slave movements in the US produced central reflections on gender and race. In 1851, Sayori Truth delivered already her famous speech to the Women's Rights Convention in Ohio by repeatedly asking the question, I'm a woman, she made visible the tensions between herself as a black woman and the image of women defended by, by white feminists. In addition to this, in Europe, there were socialist women making intersectional claims at the turn of the 20th century. Since then, we can say that intersectional research has greatly developed in politics, sociology, geography, natural sciences. Thus, intersectional feminism may provide, according to Antia, quoting, a tool for analyzing positions and outcomes produced through the intersections of different social structures and processes, including transnational ones." End quote. These aspects point to the connection then between intersectional and transnational feminism. When Alexander published Pedagogies of Crossing in 2005, she defined the field she was working on as transnational feminism, an ideology which evoked international gatherings and imperial of the colonial thought and postcolonial studies. In keeping with Blackwell, Briggs, and Chew, we can say the transnational refers to an emergent post 1960s movement, which attempted to center new immigrants along with the new forms of globalization and resistance. Transnational feminism acts as a political tool to analyze women's situations in the global world and provide a feminist alternative to colonial, liberal, and Western models of thought. Although transnational feminism is very popular now, it was Ruel and Kaplan who settled the ground for its theorization in the 90s when they inquired, quoting them, does the new global matrix engender liberatory spaces that deconstruct the old regimes of the nation state? Or does this phenomenon continue the process of uneven development that marked our earlier colonial and neocolonial social formations? This is a question that reverberates in contemporary feminist discourses now. These authors realized that the world was organized following transnational cultural and economic flows, and gender issues were absent in this new world organization. Moreover, Kaplan was also aware of the perils of reinforcing hegemony when trying to deconstruct the powers of oppression. 
this danger of which we contemporary feminists are still aware by resorting to gurantias has been conceptualized as translocational positionality. The practice of considering our local context as researchers, but also the specificity where each category is intertwined in our analysis are located. Another facet that can lead us to argue that transnational claims are not completely new has to do with the formulation of Anzaldúa's borderlands epistemology in the 80s, when she argued for the metaphorical in-betweenness of the Chicana identity in the state. Anzaldúa's claims seem to have inspired transnational feminists to advocate for women's capacity to break down hegemonic binaries and cross international borders in the common fight for equality. Moreover, when reflecting on what is new in today's feminist panorama, Sandra Mohanty has referred to the work she carried out in 2010 by saying that the questions she had then are not, quote, substantially different, although the explicit exercise of power is more visible at this historical moment, unquote. Thus, for Mohanty, what has changed is the visibility of power differences and injustices, which has led to fostering new solidarities among feminists of all stripes and colors. Quoting her. It is in this context that many contemporary feminists consider that women in higher social position could help to facilitate the growth of autonomy in those who don't have the same opportunity. Solidarity has always been a feminist value per se, and that's why transmodern feminist critics such as Carmen García Aguilar have called for the need to learn to listen to other women so that their ideas can be recognized. This philosopher believes in the practice of genophilia as that feminist relational thinking which fosters friendship among women by going beyond their relationships with men and empowering them. These ideas are also supported by feminist philosopher Victoria Sendon de Leon in her analysis of Turin's Amigo pa uh, paradigm. paradigm. Turin declares that women are the protagonists of the changes advocated by the new world order, since they have honed their tools in fighting patriarchal domination for a long time. In addition to this, this the transnational model of relationships which characterizes plus modernity may also be regarded from a feminist prism. Caroline Petwell gives value, for instance, to the way emotions are reproduced in a globalized world through ever-changing connections. Among these emotions, she focuses on empathy as a fruitful tool to interrogate the transnational forces at work. Empathy has been defined by transmodern critics like Jeremy Rifkin as the value that will help our civilization progress. And for Pedwell, quote, it is a potent affective capacity, skill, or tool that might be cultivated to promote ethical relations between people across social and geopolitical boundaries, end quote. Although we should be attentive to the neoliberal appropriation of the mechanics of care and empathy, a feminist and anti-racist theory based on the development of empathy could contribute to fulfilling the cross-cultural social justice fostered by transmodernity as a whole. So this is like more the theoretical background I wanted to summarize, and now I will offer some examples of transmodern cultural representations that can help us visualize some principles exposed. Focusing on the marginal experiences that happened during the Second World War, North American writer Libby Cohn published War on the Margins in 2008. This is a historical novel set on Jersey during the German occupation, whose main character, Marlene Zimmer, helps us discover a good range of minor stories of war and survival. This novel shows the female characters fight against injustice and their struggle for pacifism from such marginal perspective as those of female members of the French resistance, Jewish and lesbian artists, Jewish women concealed during the occupation, together with those of British citizens, deserters, Nazi officers, bystanders. This work illustrates some of the aspects explained so far in that most of the liminal characters and focalizers are female. This aspect aligns Cohn with the transmodern regendering of the historical novel and demonstrates her interest in emphasizing the daily experiences of women during war. Her vision of women goes beyond the patriarchal depiction of female characters as nurses or dutiful workers, as they acquire active roles as rebels, prisoners. Other features that contribute to shaping the feminist message are the inclusion of historical records, to claim for the authenticity of these rebellious women's stories. Such female agency is mostly achieved through the recreation of supportive female bonds, which help all these women fight against the system. 
Their calls for peace and solidarity are fulfilled through the act of communal reunion that you can see as included the quotation, just in case you wanted to see it, depicted at the end of the narration, when all the characters, female characters, gather on the liberation day. The ordinary act of share, sharing some skin cream, this is what they do here, becomes a symbol of communion, reconciliation, and healing. The strengthening of these feminine connections allows Marlene to feel culturally united with all the people hurt by the war. And this final reunion has a clear gender dimension, as it is the women that have had an active role in fighting against the Nazi occupation in this novel. These characters' communal act of healing responds then to the transmodern model of interdependent relationships and shows that the female protagonist can transcend their suffering by looking at the faces of other female characters. This is another example, and this is the novel I am just analyzing for the round table. Uh, I am preparing with Dr. Kuznetsky for ESSE. Um, it's been written by British Jewish writer Linda Grant and published in, in 2019. Uh, said during the immediate months before and after Brexit, Grant turns London into a microcosm where the misfortunes linked to migration, racism, violence, terrorism, capitalism, the loss of privacy make a group of dissimilar characters' lives intersect around the mysterious death of an unidentified migrant woman, whom now Barry seems to recognize. This novel displays some specific narrative devices, interconnected stories, polyphony, intertwining of narrative layers and time dimension, repetition of metaphors, which feature those very recent transmodern fictions defined as, you have some of the terms here, translate, network, novel, fragmented narratives, and this novel shares many of, the, of these aspects. Moreover, this narrative embodies some of the theories on vulnerability and the ethics of care mentioned above. The figure of the other is embodied in the image of this unknown, this mysterious woman, revealed finally as Valentina Poplov, an irregular immigrant from Moldova, who is described as a blank with no ties to anything. She acts as a symbol of that mass of vulnerable people inhabiting our society. Further, human vulnerability is also linked to our intrinsic connection to others and how they can hurt or heal us in different ways, mainly in the form of the terrorist and racist attacks in London. In keeping with this, the other female protagonist, Chrissy, appears as the bond linking the different characters in the novel due to her role as a provider of care, as she is Rob's and Marcos' nurse after suffering terrorist attacks. This young Irish immigrant is sometimes idealized for her caring virtues. However, her attempts to demystify her profession demonstrate that the narrative tries to empower the role of women in caring positions. The emergence of the female caregiver as an active agent connecting vulnerable stories makes clear that Grant's novel is aligned with this ethics ideal, quote in health, to become more admirable relational persons in better caring positions, end quote. By contrast, Valentina represents the opposite perspective of a neglected victim of modern care systems. She became an object of transaction for the wealthy Russian she worked for. She, quoting in the novel, was passing through the Romanian party scene like a hand rifling a pack of cards. She was extorted by her boyfriend and she was even hated by her daughter. The fact that Grant's main symbol of the vulnerable, marginalized immigrant is a woman helps her denounce the negative effects of the multifarious crises dominating in our society and how they have affected women more strongly. Another popular example, perhaps you didn't know the other two, but I'm sure you will know this novel, is Chimamanda and Gotzi Adichis Americana, uh, published in 2013. This novel recounts the story of young lovers, Ifemelu and Odinze, when they leave Nigeria for the West. If Emelu has the opportunity to go to America, she obtains academic success there, but has to fight against a lot of stereotypes. Where they also been saying that living an undocumented life in London. Time goes by and they reunite in democratic Nigeria, calling our attention to the motive of the journey and its implications for current transnational subjects. But also I'd like to pay attention to another transmodern facet depicted by Adichie. And this aspect has also been studied by a member of our, of our group, Violeta Vinces, she's a PhD student. And she has also focused on the fluidity of contemporary migrant identity in the era of technology, the internet, and the social media. Ifemelu creates a blog dealing with race issues in the state, and she becomes really popular because of that. 
turning her blog into a network of dialogue, support, and empowerment for many immigrant women. This online space fosters the relational feeling of sisterhood and empathy, aimed at by transmodern feminist critics and by giving voice to minor stories of women. Moreover, graphic novels can be also a fruitful site where women symbolize their hybrid and transnational identities. An interesting example would be that of Willow Wilson and Adrian Alfona's Miss Marvel No Normal, where the protagonist, Kamala, a second generation Pakistani immigrant grown up in the States, acquires supernatural powers. She receives a power that the media do not usually offer to anyone from her background, and she uses it to save people while wearing patriotic American colors. By deconstructing deeply rooted stereotypes about the Muslim populations in America, this fictional character may change people's assumptions about Islam and Pakistani culture. This graphic novel acts then as a fruitful platform where transitionality and transnationality are depicted from multifarious female perspectives. Drawing on some examples, mixing up the world of the cinema and literature, Hulu's TV series, The Handmaid's Tale, and Margaret Atwood's stick role in the Testament need to be mentioned. Dr. Julia Kuznetsky has recently analyzed these cultural artifacts as examples of the transmodern interest in the physicality and vulnerability of the female body. In her contribution to the special issue on Beneath the Graves, Feminisms in the Transmodern Era, co-edited by my colleagues Barbara Risti, Silvia Martinez, and myself, she explains that in both the series and at good sequel, the female body appears as a site of social construction, vulnerability, and control. It's a site of physical resistance, exceeding totalitarian categories, and allowing for diversity, whereas it is massively repressed under patriarchal violence. She also explores the genre of feminist dystopia as essential in the configuration of transmodern literature. I am not an expert, but many critics are pointing out at the reemergence of the genres of science fiction and dystopia from renewed feminist perspective as a clear transmodern tendency. Continuing with this mixture between the literary and the visual world, Celeste Sanji's novel Little Fires Everywhere and the adaptation to the screen in the series format, carried out again by Hulu and produced and starred by Louise Witherspoon, problematizes some issues that are representative of feminist concerns in the transmodern era, mainly motherhood, classism, and racism through its two female interconnected but opposed protagonists, Elena Richardson and Mia Warren. Elena and her family represent the high class, white family values of the domestic, classic life of following the rules in the suburbs of Cleveland and the social and economic success of its inhabitants versus the bohemian life and free life embodied by Mia. This mysterious black artist in, and her teenage daughter, daughter Pearl rent a house from the Richardsons and soon the two women become more than tenants. The main crisis breaks out when Elena's friends try to adopt a Chinese American baby and a custody battle explodes, placing Mia and Elena on conflicting sides. Suspicious of Mia, Elena uncovers the secrets in her past, revealing that she was going to be a surrogate mother for Pearl, but furtively decided to keep the baby. But her obsession brings forward the rapture of her own family. We can see then that these narratives expound a conflict concerning motherhood, tolerance, and understanding among ethnic groups. Yet this time, the female bonds do not become a space of rationality and sorority, but of conflict, demonstrating that race and class are still separating women, at least in the States, against what intersectional and transnational feminist claims want to achieve. We reach a different conclusion when we watch HBO TV series Big Little Lies, also starred by Louise Witherspoon, since on this occasion we witness the construction of a female universe of mothers bonding to deconstruct all kinds of female cliches. This challenge reaches its catharsis when the female group reacts against the domestic abuse suffered by one of the protagonists and hides the secret behind the killing of her husband. This time, relationality and female affects provide support to the abused woman showing that domestic violence does not understand an outbreak of class. I also wanted to include some examples from the visual arts, because they are very good uh, to show how women are using imagination to reinvent themselves by trespassing boundaries and trying to connect despite the local peculiarities of their context. For instance, the photographical exhibition Mirada de Iberoamerica in 2015 focused on the issue of gender and immigration to promote the need to defend human rights and equality 
among South American female immigrants here in Spain. The winner, Lina Muha, was a German woman, but she embodied the transmodern feminist idea that women can connect across cultures and across the globe in depicting and denouncing their difficult experiences. She was German, but in the photograph, Rosalba, she gave voice to a South American woman who perhaps would not have found a space to become visible if it had not been because of this European photographer. Another similar project is the one carried out by the Association Migrantas, a visual language of migration set up in Berlin. Working with public urban spaces as its platform, Migranta aims to make visible the feelings of those women who have left their country. And you have the, what they explain on their website. Hmm? They work on issues of migration, um, identity, intercultural dialogue. Their work incorporates tools from the visual arts, graphic design, social sciences, and the resulting drawings with these women are then condensed into pictograms that are distributed in public places, as those you have on the screen. So now I would like to reach uh, the, the end of my presentation and go back to the initial question I posed. Can we say that the transmodern paradigm offers the impulse that contemporary feminism needs right now? Well, I know this is a very complex question, but I hope to have shown that the transmodern paradigm has inherited from previous feminist trends is intrinsically transnational, relational and intersectional nature. However, although an insight into the fields of intersectional and transnational feminism may be beneficial when defining the aims of the transmodern feminist struggle, this renewed commitment may also contribute to an extreme generalization of feminist principles or the appropriation of feminism by the media. We should pay attention to all these legacies of colonialism, endocentrism, and cultural relativism that intersectional and transnational feminist theories tried to eradicate. In addition to this, I've also illustrated that art may be the place where contemporary transnational, transmodern, hybrid, and all marginalized identities can be negotiated. Cultural representations can help us become more empathic towards many inequalities still affecting women's lives. This way, I will wind up my presentation by drawing on Richard's idea when she claims that mainly in this case literature is a fruitful tool that, quote, affords the transnationalist change of cultural realities in the period of late capital, end quote. On the grounds that this change of cultures that may be represented in literature imply the sharing of experiences, solidarity, and empathy among women across the globe. So well, I've also included here all the sources I've been using for, for this project. As I'm telling you, this is a part of a, a work in progress of an article I'm writing, and also for the discussions I've had with my colleagues when writing the introduction for the special issue that Dr. Konevsky and myself mentioned. Also, we had a research project, a minor research project focusing on, on these aspects. And um, in many of our discussions, we were wondering what was new, you know, what is really new in the feminist panorama? Uh, what can the transmodern paradigm bring into contemporary feminism? And um, I hope to have been able to summarize many of these ideas today for you. So, well, thank you. Uh, gracias, and Aita. I hope I have, I have pronounced it correctly. <laughs> so, well, I will stop, I think, sharing my screen. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sylvia, for this very rich introduction and uh, ample food for thinking. And now I, I would like to ask our bright uh, PhD student Xenia to uh, have a discussion with you and ask questions and, and maybe we'll all move towards what you have been asking in the research questions and provide some new ideas on, on the topic. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was very stimulating and it's nice to discuss something that isn't simply relegated to the domain of literary studies but has a political potential as well. Uh, uh, would you prefer that I say everything I have to say at once or uh, should I go point by point and have you respond uh, after each of them? As, as you prefer. I don't know how we usually do it. Or... I mean, I, I, I guess then I will speak it all at once uh, and then we maybe have a discussion. Okay. And uh, although what I will be speaking would be quite, um, how to say, challenging in a sense that I have quite a few of doubts, but hopefully 
hopefully it will provide some uh, fruitful results. So please don't take these bits of criticism as, as an attack. That, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, okay, so first point that uh, caused my doubts uh, was uh, the one about the term uh, transmodernity or transmodernism, as I found it uh, on the net, uh, especially the point that it could mean the same as all those other notions that you showed, uh, because I frankly doubt that all theories that propose these different notions actually imply the, the same phenomena. Obviously, they want to describe the moment we live in now, but what uh, they uh, valorize within it, I think is uh, very different. Uh, then uh, I did very little reading about transmodernity, uh, but from what I found, uh, at least uh, the, the, the philosopher who conceptualized it, uh, Dussel, uh, he seemed to make quite a um, big uh, accent on the importance of religion and some sort of universalism and the importance of family. So for me, this uh, makes the origins of, the, of this concept quite suspect, because I would say that for contemporary feminism, uh, uh, what matters more than notion of family is the notion of the communities that do not concentrate on the blood bond that unites them, but on the choice, on empathy. Uh, and this connects me to the next point, that uh, why do we speak about feminism and not feminisms? Uh, I think that if we combine this uh, universalism of transmodernity with the idea of global feminism as once, we get this very unifying vision of what different groups of women want and need. So this is uh, something that really worries me. Uh, and to pass to the literary part, uh, I think I had problem with two examples you suggested. Uh, first was with uh, Linda Grant's novel and one once again, I haven't read it. I'm just basing this on uh, your presentation. Uh, I find it very problematic uh, that you uh, presented this uh, character, Valentina, as a symbol for all marginalized identities. Because, uh, first of all, I'm always suspect about uh, Anglophone writers, uh, either from America or from Britain, uh, presenting Eastern European migrants. Uh, because I'm not sure that for the author, there is a difference be between uh, the woman from Moldova or the woman from Romania or the woman from the Ukraine. But the, the experience of a migrant from Moldova would be extremely different from the one of even from Poland let alone Russia or Belarus. And I think this really should be taken into account. And I'm not even speaking about in, like a, mag a woman migrant from India. This is a completely different story. One size simply doesn't fit all. So we shouldn't maybe um, uh, trust so much this idea of a symbol, so rely on it. Uh, and the final point uh, is about your example with uh, Miss Marvel. Uh, on the one hand, uh, as you put it, it could be seen as this subversion of the stereotype of the Pakistani migrant. But on the other hand, this expression that you suggested, uh, wearing patriotic American colors, I think there is trap already in this, uh, in this formula, in this sentence that doesn't lead us to this global Americanized the version of the of the identity and uh, of values. So yeah, sorry for being so negative, but I just oh. wanted to enliven the discussion. So yes, please. I Thank you. Negative at all, but I think it's part of what we do. Problematize all the ideas and the things we did. Hmm? Well, I will try to see if I can reply to all of these ideas. Well, uh, of course, all the different labels are, are, are provided, like postmodernism, metamodernism, postmodernism. They are not the same. I was just trying to say that contemporary critics in the turn of the century have tried to define the moment we are living, uh, providing different uh, theories and different labels. We have been investigating these different labels, and in the end, the one that 
convinced or the one that we wanted to explore more in detail was trust modernity because we think it's broader. We think, we think it does not only imply a period of time, as I said, but a way of being in the world. And also the way we discovered uh, trust modernity uh, was not mainly through Dussel, but we did it um, from a Spanish philosopher, uh, Rosa Maria Rodriguez Magda. Uh, we can say that yes, Dussel is there, is one of the first authors pointing out to uh, add trans modernity, but also this Spanish philosopher, uh, when already she was starting to publish about this period at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. And what uh, Rosa Maria Rodriguez Magda has done is to provide these theories with the feminist or with the more feminist standpoint. That's the, why we adopted many of her, of her theories. For instance, she has recently published a book, the things that she mainly publishes in Spanish, although we have some translations. For instance, my colleagues organized the conference uh, some years ago. Um, you have an interview with uh, Rosa Maria Rodriguez Marda in, in English. So at least uh, some of her papers are translated into English. And she has a recent uh, collection entitled in Spanish, La Mujer Molesta, which is like the annoying woman. And she has been also very controversial uh, uh, with many topics dealing with feminism nowadays. So, so we embraced more her definition because she was more in the feminist line of thought. Also, she was linking all these phenomena more to literature, which is what we do in the end. As philosophers like Roussel, as you said, are more aligned with sociology, history, uh, they come from a different background. Hmm? So I think, uh, would you say, yes, some of the original ideas, perhaps by Dussel, come more from this uh, South American line of thought, but the ones we have tried to incorporate in our research are a bit more recent and more adapted to our text and to our, our ideas. And for instance, I mainly follow Magda, also I really like Ateljevic because she mentions this idea of the post-patriarchal, also, we've been following a lot of Rifkin, GC, uh, who have been elaborating a lot on theories of relationality, ethics. Hmm? So, uh, yes, there is a lot of things to be there no? when we start to get acquainted with the term of, of transmodernity. Hmm? At any term, what we do is to problematize it, of course. We cannot believe that this term contains now all the truth, mainly in the era of post-truth. No? But uh, we really think something has changed. Uh, and, and we are trying to define it. And, and what are the repercussions of this in literature or in other artistic expression? Hmm? As for feminism, yes, I tend to, to talk about feminisms usually. So sorry if I didn't do it today or I didn't do it so explicitly because this is what uh, I've been doing the special issue we've been publishing in plural. I was also trying to say feminist, different feminist trends, different feminist movements and the plurality of them. And even more so nowadays, uh, we cannot say that feminism is one thing, or when I was quoting Mohanty, you know, that says that now uh, feminism is uh, all full of stripes and colors. You know? So it's really, um, it's something really plural. Also, when we were um, uh, researching uh, for this special issue, uh, in which Julia is also collaborating, uh, for the introduction, we were reading and we were problematizing, well, this is a different aspect, but I just <laughs> to, uh, tell you about that, about the concept of the waves, no? the feminist waves. And we even reached our conclusion that perhaps this periodization of waves is not so accurate, or uh, we could use a different terminology because in the end, different feminist movements, they are also cross-connected across time, and they cannot be so easily separated. Uh, in different periods or in different waves. That's why the collection is entitled Beneath the Waves, because we think that the different trends uh, that we have in feminism nowadays go back to some of the ideas I was mentioning today from the past, while looking at the future and trying to address some of the problematics of the present. So yes, this idea of plurality is of course there and, and has to be. Hmm? Uh, well, thank you very much for your comment on Grant's novel. Um, well, I think the author, um, I don't know exactly what kind of research she did, but she's, um, she's a third Jewish, uh, British Jewish uh, immigrant, and she has a long expertise. She has published a lot also in, 
dealing with aspects related to Jewish migration um, and these issues. So uh, I cannot say really she for her different to be from Romania or Moldova, but I know she's entitled to talk about these issues because they have affected her personally. Uh, her grandparents were in the Holocaust. So I don't think she does it for any kind of commercial marketing purposes, but she's always, she's always been really interested in memory, in the idea of transgenerational connections. This novel is really different because it's the one that is more contemporary, uh, addressing the consequences of Brexit, as I, I was mentioning before. And yes, I think, well, I didn't have time to explain about this novel because I have just written a paper of 9,000 words about this novel and it's difficult to summarize. With the idea of the symbol, I wanted to say that the, it's very important in this novel that the two main female protagonists, the two of them are immigrants, but how differently they are portrayed. More like they embody, if not symbolize, perhaps uh, that word hmm, may be more problematic. Um, the fact that the legal, well, I don't like calling <laughs> legal or illegal, but the regular uh, Irish immigrant uh, who is crazy is the one that symbolizes these values of care, hmm, is the one that connects all the characters across the story. Although they're constructing some of these notions related to uh, women in positions of care. And the other character that is also connected to all the other stories, because it's always like made of subplots, sub-stories connected, and all the characters are linked to Chrissy or Valentina in different moments of the narration. So then the other woman, who is the irregular, or the one that doesn't have the passport, uh, her papers, is the one that ends up killing herself, and the one that doesn't have a proper name. So I think the novel really problematizes this aspect of, uh, in a, it criticizes this aspect of who has the right to be entitled legal or illegal immigrant, and how our societies are not paying attention to all these women who mm, don't have their papers or you know are more like anonymous, unidentified. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Miss Marvel, yes, I think there is a clash. Uh, there is a contradiction there. Uh, between a character that mm, seems to be subversive, but also trying to look as much as American as she could, you know. But I think this is the clash we find in many, in many transnational narratives or immigrant narratives. No? This, this conflict between belonging, uh, not belonging, wanting to belong. And I think this is what really deserves attention in narratives like this to analyze that, that, that clash, that collapse, you know, of the to directions. No? I think I mentioned all these things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much. You, you made it very clear. And uh, thank you in particular for this clarification of uh, Grant's position on uh, this makes it much more uh, in depth. Yeah, now I am really want to read the novel myself because yeah, this juxtaposition of two types of, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so if, if you read the novel, also you have in the background, you have these stories connected, blah, blah. Uh, you have the deportees and the asylum seekers that in this case, in this novel, they are like imprisoned uh, in boats in the river Thames. So it's like the concentration camps or the different camps we have nowadays for the refugees in Greece. In this novel, they are in London and they are in the background. And also this idea is very important that in the end, at least Valentina was found as uh, she had an identity, but then you have a mass of uh, subjects who seem not to be, no, who seem not to be important. Or uh, also, I've been relating these ideas to the ideas of the grievable lives, the lives that matter, those that don't matter. You know, Judith Butler, Sigmund Bowman. Uh, so all these ideas are there too. So I guess Yulia, we can uh, offer the floor to someone else. Yes, thank you very much. That, that was a, a very good start, a very stimulating. Uh, so anyone who has any questions, please, or interventions or ideas or continuation of what uh, Xenia has started, please um, take the floor. Silvia, if I, if I may. Um, so I would like to go back to this term, transmodern, obviously terminology is always problematic since there are so many synonyms and different concepts. Uh, and this is something that you started with, say mentioning postmodernism, 
but you never somehow explain the difference in your in your position in your paper how is transmodernism or transmodernity different from postmodernism because later you started listing features of what i consider pure postmodernism this uh, you know uh, uh, multiculturalism and subversion of stereotypes and all kinds of playfulness so how, how is transmodernism different from postmodernism well, in practical terms, uh, for instance, in fiction, uh, you can see that in postmodernism, history uh, was deconstructed, or this idea that history has to be at the same level as any other kind of discourse fiction, and mainly um, this was made more in a for from the playfulness perspective. You find this, no? But now, when you have historical novels uh, from more the transmodern perspective or paradigm. Um, they want again to, they still see history as discourse, but they are trying to look for some objectivity. It's not that they try to turn it upside, upside down. They are trying to look for some kind of real, uh, well, real, <laughs> you know, in inverted commas, but some uh, marginalized mainly stories, stories that belong to minorities that have not been heard before. So you find a lot of resources, for instance, mixture of genres, photographs, diaries, but with the aim not of saying that that, his, that history, that the hegemonical history was not true, but showing different truths or different versions of that history. For instance, in, the, in, in that specific example. But I think in what this term of transmodernity, maybe this is what Magda explained, is like a synthesis, if you follow Hegel's idea no, of the synthesis uh, in history, that um, with transmodernity, uh, philosophers, critics, or what we are seeing in different cultural representations, are trying to go back to some of the ideas of modernism, of the importance of the, of the subject and the recovery of our human essence, all that, but without losing track of all the criticism that postmodernism made of, of modernist claims. So it's more like a synthesis of both and trying to achieve like a new, a new paradigm. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. We always, I think with, when you go for one of these terms, wow, this generates a lot of discussion, you know, also with the idea of trans, uh, you know, that now it seems to be also very fashionable to apply this prefix to any kind of criticism or theories. We've also, we discuss also a lot, uh, maybe at the beginning of our project, we had a lot of discussions about, about this. And as I was telling you, it, what is really new, and we critics, we always, we try to define the moment we are living in and thinking that everything is completely new when it's, it's not. And, but well, we can go back and see how I, the ideas of some decades ago are now more or less visible. How, there is always something that has been changed. It's not completely the same. Yes, if I may add from what I gathered from participating in the discussions of Sylvia's research group is uh, transmodernism is different from postmodernism in that it is less playful and, and more kind of real and, and serious about the things that are really taking place. And, and it stresses more this idea, as, as Sylvia also said today, of vulnerability and, and trauma and some traumatic histories that are also very real and uh, this idea of grief, grievability, and including more uh, or, or stressing the vulnerability of other others uh, who have no, who cannot afford this postmodern playfulness because their problems are, are really uh, real problems. And, and then this inclusivity of maybe species as well, not, not just, you know, marginalized human groups, uh, but also the environment. I was going to ask the, the vulnerability of, uh, of that um, um, additional, you know, um, corpus uh, of consideration, mm -hmm. uh, how much is it there in, in transmodernism? Yeah, also we had a lot of discussions because, well, sometimes transmodernity and some of the philosophers seem to be like too um, optimistic about all the fruitfulness of this intercultural dialogue, uh, inclusivity, when sometimes you look at our contemporary world and we don't seem to see all these all these things. Also, you have to be careful with that and don't 
let yourself <laughs> be so carried away by this optimism and try to problematize it all the time and see uh, and be careful you know, with appropriating many of these ideas. And also um, many of the ideas fostered by transmodernity now have been developed by postcolonial studies uh, many decades ago. But I think that now they have become more visible at least, no? and they are, uh, they are becoming a bit more mainstream in inverted commas, but uh, that's, we also have to be attentive to, <laughs> to these dangers now of using these big terms. Yeah, I think it is, it continues what uh, Xenia just uh, raised the issue of uh, not seeing different ethnic groups as having similar experiences and, and not yeah. using as a symbol. Okay. This combination, hybridity, anything goes, th these are more the keywords for postmodernism. Mm -hmm. For transmodernism, it's looking at precisely at the experiences and vulnerabilities of others. Yeah, I think that it goes very well with intersectional feminism or transnational feminism because of that, no? Because from an intersectional perspective, we are supposed to take into account all the different factors that can make a specific woman or a specific group of women be oppressed and to try not to gener generalize, as, as you said. Hmm? Or this translocational positionality that we as critics have also to be aware of how, by using some concepts, we can be contributing to the Eurocentrism or Westernization that we try to avoid. So I think, yes, all the time we should have this critical eye with us in order not to be uh, carried away by the... <laughs> Isms. Yes. <laughs> Yes, A any more questions from my colleagues and, and guests and, and students? Or comments? Well, I can ask about, uh, f first of all, thank you very much, Sylvia. It was really interesting and, and uh, for me, many new things. So, so thank you. <laughs> Always to learn. Um, I wanted to ask exactly be, uh, about this inter intersectional uh, so empathy or, um, because I, at the beginning, it, se it seemed to me that the, the position that you are kind of uh, advocating for the, the trans um, uh, modern so feminism, it is, uh, um, I mean, it supports uh, this kind of intersectionality. But now, when you were so answering, it seems to me, <laughs> it seems to me, it is, it is critical a bit because uh, actually, I, yeah, I personally have problems so with intersectionality always because it's a bit of a trap, as you were saying. Actually, it's risky so, uh, because it's it's very easy to see to 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 say to people, so be empathical, so we fall, so <laughs> it doesn't matter, so <laughs> what are the differences and so on and so forth. So I think um, um, if we want to address uh, uh, inequalities, uh, so in a, we have a lot of different inequal, kind of inequalities so that um, we have to make different alliances uh, depending on the kind of inequality we are addressing. So, so that's the idea. That, that's why probably this idea of a kind of universal um, uh, intersectional empathy is problematic. So, because uh, because when you have a, a very uh, concrete uh, uh, kind of inequality, it's very difficult so to to develop this kind of. Uh, um, of intersectionality, and so that yeah. you have to decide which which is the section you are <laughs> you are siding with so in a yeah, way. And mainly when you go in the end, we do our research, we publish papers, or so you write your articles, and apply this theory really then to text or to different cultural artifacts is really difficult. Uh, because as you said, you have many things to take into account and to show how they intersect. I think that's what's really difficult and, and to demonstrate that. Uh, I think it, it, that's a really uh, difficult aspect of using intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Also, I, 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 I wanted to say that mainly this, uh, or this paper, my article, some of the ideas we had in this introduction for the special issue, 
came because we were trying to define what is modern, what is mm, the different feminism mm, well, nowadays, no? And where what are the different currents, trends? Do we have something uh, different, new from the past? And then I was reading a lot, and and I realized that there is not such thing as transmodern feminism. Uh, that's my, that was my final conclusion. But I, but I think that transmodernity has absorbed many of these theories I have been mentioned across the, my talk today, and has is fem, should be, if uh, applied and understood correctly, feminist itself. So perhaps we don't have to talk about a special transmodern feminism or transmodern feminisms, because this philosophy, if it's supposed to be inclusive of all human beings uh, on earth, of all livings on earth, uh, if it really fosters that kind, that kind of interculturality, then it is feminist itself. And it's also implying, it has also absorbed all these ideas about the ethics of care, relational autonomy, relationality, multidirectionality, intersectional, transnational analysis. So that was the main question. And that's my main research question when I, I am writing now this article. If we can say that there is something like transmodern feminisms or different trends of feminisms under transmodernity, or we can really say that transmodernity implies all these feminist principles that have been discussed in some previous hmm, movements or if not waves, as we are also problematizing that kind of concept. Thank you. Any more questions? You say that this uh, includes all living beings on earth. Uh, maybe it's a bit provocative, but what is the place of men in this discourse? Does it imply <laughs> like male version <laughs> of how to, uh, what, what could be the attitude? Well, you find in our team, we've analyzed some, some works by men that are really uh, purely transmodern, like David Mitchell, uh, Cloud Atlas is the typical example. Uh, but you know, some of these works do not problematize the experience of women that much, but in that, but we don't have to reject them because they are also part of what is being uh, done now. But I think that really, um, with these patriarchal backlashes I was mentioning at the beginning, we have a problem uh, we, as we have some groups of men that have been threatened you know, by all these movements, Me Too, or different feminist movements across the globe. Uh, they've been even described as the um, angry white angry men, or there is a, a kind of terminology describing these these men. And these are, I think, this is the the audience that should also be attentive to all the changes that are being done in literature, in arts, trying to portray relationships between men and women in more egalitarian terms. But we are seeming to go in opposing directions. As, we see men more and more um, aware of gender issues and on the opposite side, those that are feeling threatened by all these movements and, and ideas, which is really dangerous, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, any more ideas? including remarks, arguments, questions. So I suppose we, we got, um, Reading a reading list and and also um, <laughs> names to look into for for the future. Um, then yeah, but for the reading list, uh, sorry, uh, you maybe uh, send it somewhere so uh, so we could share it. I don't know, so how so everyone could get it. Sorry. Yeah, the list. I think I didn't have the word cited in that version, so I could send you the new one if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you if you send the 
we're excited that that would be good if anyone wants to continue researching and, and reading up on the transmodern paradigm that would be great yes so Kadri is asking is thanking oh. Sarah for oh. the fascinating talk uh, I'll read it I could not actually participate because taking care of a 10 week old baby so that much about combining uh, work and, and uh, motherhood and thanks everyone for coming uh, so she's sharing the website you can see it in okay. the chat for our gender group um, and uh, it lists also the upcoming events. Uh, the next will be on the 14th of May, uh, when our own Tallinn University School of Humanities uh, professor of uh, Asian Studies, uh, Lisa Indrakolo, will be uh, speaking about medieval Chinese manuals for, for the Chinese women uh, from the gender perspective. So everyone is welcome, including Thank our- Thank you very members. much. And uh, I hope this has been useful or thought provoking for you at least. <laughs> And um, still, well, as I've told you, there's uh, much work to be done uh, in these lines. So let's keep on working on that. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much, Sylvia. Let us keep in touch. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have an enjoyable weekend. And see you at our next mm -hmm. seminars. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Writing, thank you for making yeah. it smarter. And these uh, are the words. Nice. Uh -huh. Ah, this is the two of us now. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>